Good morning, everybody. My name is Beverly O'Neill. Uh, I'm a Tanaha citizen. I'm going to be your host today for the third session of the Canadian Agriculture Human Resources Council National Indigenous Agriculture Speaking or Sharing Circles. Um, today we're going to be going. Uh, today's topic is product. Uh, is on production, marketing, and packaging. So welcome everyone. We have a number of people as participants here online. A uh, couple things to, re a couple reminders here is that this is a webinar session, meaning that um, for our participants, you'll just be seeing our speakers. A uh, reminder that if you have any questions, please feel free to add them into the Q&A or into chat. As we get started here, I invite you to share your name and your organization, where you're from in the chat, let everybody know who you are, where you're from. Um, before we get started to, uh, it's important as Indigenous people, we extend our appreciation to the Indigenous nations whose land we're on. And, and for myself, I am residing in the traditional unceded lands of the Coast Salish being specifically the Musqueam, Squamish and the tsleil people. So grateful that um, that I get to be here on their beautiful lands and, and, uh, and um, I'm grateful for their hosp hospitality. Um, we've got a great panel for you today. Our panelists are uh, Paul Langdon from Ulnuig, Jolene Lasky from uh, Wabanaki Maple Syrup, and Mike Randall from Lenox Island First Nation. Our co-host in today's session is um, Ulnu Ulnuig, and they have a number of different services that they they offer. So I don't want to take things away from what Paul is going to share with you share with you today. Um, and of course, Canadian Agriculture and Human Resources Canada are, is the reason that we're, we're here today is they're the primary organizers of, of this event and of our four speakers of our four speaker series. So uh, just scoot over to our, our session here. Um, a couple things before we get started is um, we We'll also at the end of the session be drawing for the Indigenous attendees three $100 draws. So um, those of you who have been on these sessions before, you know that you must be present to win. So when we get to that session, we'll, we'll prod up. We'll also introduce you to who our speakers are for the next, for the following two sessions. Um, near the end of our, after our speakers, we'll have uh, Agriculture, Agri-Foods Canada is going to give an overview of their programs. Um, something I want to let you know is that one of the things we do in these sessions is we also gather the contact information from the speakers and any websites or resources that they identify, and we send them off after the end of each session. So don't worry about taking email addresses unless you want to contact someone right away after, but we'll be posting and sharing with you all of the resource lists, including the, e the web addresses for each of our three speakers today and, um, and any other resources that that come up along the way. Following all five sessions, we'll also be sending the final updated version of it. So don't worry about taking information down. Another thing is the sessions are being recorded. From there, CARC will be editing them into, into, into clips from key messages that we heard in all of the sessions, and then they'll be posting them on their website. So that is um, another way for you to keep track of some of the key messages you've heard or if you've missed a session you'll you'll get to see um, clips from those sessions on CARC website and I anticipate that'll be in probably um, uh, the new year uh, January February kind of kind of kind of thing last thing is we do a post session survey Aaron is your technology master for these sessions he is the one that um, will send out the post session survey plus um, the summary and is the one that coordinates the draws for the end. So uh, thank you guys all for joining us. As I mentioned, our co-host in this session is the um, is the um, uh, Ulnuwig Aboriginal Business Services Society. And I'd like to introduce now Jade Reeve. She is with Canadian Agricultural Human Resources Council, and she's just going to do a welcome and a quick overview of what CARC does. Hi everyone. So I would like to welcome you today to our sharing circle on behalf of the Canadian Agricultural HR Council. Over the past year and a half, we have reached out to Indigenous agricultural operators and those interested in starting ag businesses about opportunities for increasing participation in agriculture. 
And since then, we've heard that people were really interested in being a part of a network to share their stories and learn from each other. So that's the purpose of these uh, sharing circles was to really be able to connect people and, and begin sharing stories and, and learning. Um, and we feel that it could be the beginning of a network and with topics and formats that can be determined by the group members themselves. And we do look forward to hearing from you guys about what that could look like in the future. Um, and near the end of this, there is an evaluation and, uh, and we do keenly hope to get feedback on what you'd like to see moving on to the future so that we can uh, work together to come up with ways to continue these sharing opportunities. So thank you again and welcome and enjoy the session. And thank you, Jade. Um, as I mentioned, our co-host for the sessions, Ulnawig Aboriginal Business Services. All of our speakers are from Atlantic Canada. Uh, to let you know, during the sessions that Jade had mentioned that CARC had, uh, had been conducting with um, Indigenous and, and First Nations uh, organizations and operators in all areas of agriculture, of agriculture that goes from from cattle ranching to beekeeping to greenhousing, um, seed production, uh, cultural practices and labor, and and uh, and today onto uh, onto production. For me, what really stood out is the amazing things that Atlantic Canada is doing. They they have done. Um, um, showing, I, I guess, others across Canada how First Nations can really be, be leaders in creating food security and um, and finding finding your position back in in the agriculture and food industry in, in your area in your homelands itself. Um, Ulnawig, I, I I keep raving about their website. I love their website. If you guys have have not visited it before, do it. To me, is one of the top Aboriginal um, cattle corporations. Indigenous financial institutions websites across Canada has got incredibly useful tools on it, and they do a ton of a ton of different things. Our speakers today is um, uh, Paul Langdon. He's going to be speaking from Ulnawig Aboriginal Business Services. We've got um, so Paul, get, uh, give everybody a wave so people know who you are. We also have Mike Randall. He's with Lennox Island First Nations Development. He's their economic development leader, and they're doing amazing things in large production and food security. And we've got Jolene Lasky, uh, Wabanaki Maple Syrup. Um, she's tapping trees and bottling them um, and flavoring them with whiskey and brandy. You guys have to see the packaging. Uh, it's absolutely amazing. If you haven't tried her maple syrup yet, it's delicious. We had it the other weekend on our pancakes, my running group, and it was something we all looked forward, forward to um, during our run. Absolutely delicious. So really excited to have our, our three speakers here today. Um, I am now going to um, ask uh, Jade if she can just do a little introduction on what the um, National Occupational Standards uh, Initiative is, and then we're going to get into um, uh, Paul speaking about Ulnawig. Absolutely. Thanks, Beverly. Um, yeah, so CARC has done extensive research to really understand all of the modern jobs in agriculture, and we've done that across many different commodity groups. And so we have selected five that we thought would be of interest and apply to um, Indigenous agricultural operators that may have an interest in helping us with this research to ensure that we can put um, an Indigenous lens on it and make sure that some of the production practices and some of the information contained within these, these documents has that reflection. Um, so basically what they are is detailed uh, task list. So it, it really spells out, it doesn't, it, they, they will help inform training. Um, it doesn't have the how and the why, but it spells out from A to Z what you need to do to be proficient within your role as a worker, as a supervisor, as a manager. And, and um, what we're hopeful for is that we can find people that would be interested in reviewing it and making sure that we haven't missed anything, or if we need to adapt things that we would like to, to make sure we can do that to make it all encompassing. So if you have any questions about that, uh, you can certainly send me a chat message or an email. I'd be happy to discuss. And then we're going to be um, working to, to share these with people that are interested and collect that feedback. So you'll hear from myself and Beverly as we move forward. If you have an interest, don't, don't hesitate to reach out. Thanks. Okay. 
Thank you, Jade. And, and as you mentioned, the National Occupational Standard Groups that they'll be seeking feedback from are those five. So if uh, you have an interest, send a message to Jade either through her email or directly through chat during these sessions would be would be great too. So we're looking for some people who have experience, awareness in, in, in any one of these five categories to, pro to provide and apply the Indigenous lens to them. Um, and, and what are our standards in our Indigenous operations? So, um, and Jade, the wage, su wage subsidy. Uh, yes, and this is another initiative we have underway where there's an opportunity to um, receive a wage subsidy as an employer per student that you would engage, but the student must be enrolled in a, in a current program that has a work placement. Um, but for more information, this runs until the end of March. We would be happy to share more information. You can, I can put the link in the chat uh, to make sure that you can access the, the web for more information. Or again, contact me and I'd be happy to chat with you to help you find out how this may work for you as an employer. Hey, thanks, Jaden. And, and um, Aaron, why don't we add that link to the chat so while, we're, while our panelists are, are speaking, people want to just take a quick visit. And even though you guys see that this is running from September to the end of end of March, and you're going, but our agricultural season is already over. Um, thing is, is that this can be used for any any operation. I understand in in your in your in your business from web design to to planning um, to um, to getting technical. So it, it's broad. So just check in with Cark, and they'll give you further information on what it is. So so. Um, there you go. Um, we're now going to go to our first speaker, and this is our co-host. When we're doing these sessions, we also wanted to raise awareness of the different Indigenous organizations and initiatives out there are taking the lead in supporting Indigenous and First Nations agriculture, aquaculture, and, and food production initiatives. So I'm going to just change over here to the Ulnawig um, uh, uh, PowerPoint. And if Paul Langdon, if you can just come on screen and I'll just uh, bring you up. Bring your PowerPoint up. So hello, Paul. Hello, Beverly. Thank you for the kind words about our website. Okay. There we go. All right. Uh, just a brief, brief intro. Yeah, Onaweg is a 35 year plus 35 year old uh, nonprofit uh, Aboriginal financial institute or capital corporation, and we've been around. Uh, and, and we have developed a, a unique position here in Atlantic Canada. We are unique in that we represent and we provide the federal government's business services to the four Atlantic provinces um, and extend some of that into Quebec, into the Mi'kmaq communities in Quebec. But over time, uh, UNAWEC has, has reached into different areas. And this is where my position comes in under strategic initiatives. Uh, so if you want to go to the next slide, Bev. Uh, we we are you know an economic development agency's planning strategy and executions supporting capacity building providing capital and broker access uh, offering sectorial expertise in key areas of interest and undertake targeted research to address challenges and this this is very specific in, in the activities that we are now leading into and leading a broad-based effort nationally and regionally to open new avenues to access capital engagement with philanthropy um, and, and these, we, we will, I'll touch on, on some of these as we go forward. Next slide. And we, we, we my position was created to try to figure out why there was um, an underutilization or, or low participation in a lot of sectors of the economy. Specifically, it was with the Irving Shipbuilding Project for the Canadian Navy to build 60 plus billion dollars worth of ships. And uh, we, we reached out and uh, knocked our, knocked on doors, uh, got involved, talked to all the key players and uh, re realized that what we were looking at, what, what we were trying to figure out was where the ind Indigenous entrepreneur and business capacity was. Next slide. Can we get the next slide there? Let me just um there we go. There we go. It, I think the computer just froze. Sorry, Paul. Go ahead. That's all right. Um, and the, what we found was we had a healthy but limited small business community 
uh, lacking in very specific areas and capacity issues in the procurement supply chain and very limited capacity in the innovation space. But we did get a positive reception when we reached out to the, the broader uh, private sector and non-government organizations. There was a, a, a bit of, well, welcome. We wonder you know, how to become engaged. Next slide. And so what we, we created my portfolio strategic initiatives, which, which really became, which has become the conduit between the two ecosystems, between the indigenous ecosystem and the non-indigenous ecosystem. Next slide. And, and some of those things that has created unique partnerships. And this is this is just the, the most recent one that we, we've been invited to participate uh, you know, in the Halifax Port Authority. And if you've been in Halifax, the, the port in Halifax uh, is a major player uh, in the in the Halifax and Atlantic economy. And, and we've had the, the request from the peer there. They're creating um, their own innovation incubation space. And, and we've been invited to participate in that. And it's hoped that that will lead to our greater participation um, in the innovation space. Next slide. And so uh, with the challenges we had, we, we had specific ones that access to capital, limited capacity and some separation and isolation so that a lot of the indigenous participants were, were did not know how to become engaged. But on the reverse, also the, the private sector and the, the non-government organizations did also did not know how to become engaged. And so we, we, we really started to pick up that role of being that matchmaker, introducing, introducing people through, it, through various methods. Um, next, next slide. And so again, this, we, we, we started off, uh, you know, one of our big MOUs was with the Atlantic Policy Congress of the First Nations Chiefs of Atlantic Canada. Uh, to, that they are a policy-driven organization and we, and we have the mandate for economic development. Next slide. And COVE, the Center for Ocean Venture Entrepreneurship. And this is very specifically towards the ocean, the ocean economy, but has overlapping into the innovation space. And then that extends into to all areas, including fisheries, forestry, and agriculture. And when we have a, heavy, a, a large presence at COVE, uh, we work with them on, on several projects and several activities. And we have a, a, a one project that's up and running now, which we'll talk about later. Next slide. And the, the Canada's Ocean Supercluster, uh, which is part, one of the five uh, superclusters that the federal government has invested money into. And there is the protein supercluster in Saskatchewan, which is agriculture related. But uh, this, this one is a, a land of Canada based. But again, it's a, it's a matter of becoming involved so that we can get the Indigenous participation and increase the capacity. Uh, you know, our main goal with the Ocean Supercluster and with all of our partners is we have a three, three prong attack is one to increase the Indigenous capacity in that space, the entrepreneurial capacity, and two is to enhance and, and provide pathways for careers in the STEM side of things. And so the science, the technology, engineering and math and, but also to participate in the governance structure of the organization. So our partnerships are based on meaningful um, synergy or relationships. Next one. And so, as I mentioned, we created, uh, because of our involvement with COVE uh, and, and the response, we were asked to participate in creating a project to help Canada achieve its United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And we created this, this project in partnership with Cove and, and a private consulting firm, Upswing Solutions. And we are funding that. We just did, did approval to fund three Indigenous-led innovation projects that is in the ocean economy. One is to convert a, a, a diesel vessel into a solar-powered uh, electric vessel, that which would be used for we're going to test run it with uh, some of the lobster fisheries in the indigenous communities. Another is for climate change and forest fire mitigation. And another one is to build uh, pathways uh, for careers in the marine industry. And but this project, we, we built this platform, Samguanich, um, and we hope to be able to use it to move it into other spaces. This one was based on the ocean economy. We, we've already seen possibilities of doing this within forestry and the agriculture sector and the innovation in the environmental sector generally. So, th but this is a unique one. We are taking the money from government 
and then we're seeking the projects and we are delivering the projects uh, and as opposed to we 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 become the middleman uh, to get the money from uh, and this money came from ESBC but we hope to be able to pick it up from DFO uh, Canada and others to get involved uh, it's been a very very successful and all projects have you know on this one the projects have to be the majority of the activity has to be indigenous and it has to build capacity in the indigenous community, but it, and it also has to be innovative and relate to the UN sustainability. And so in, in all of the ones that are going forward, we will, sustainability will be a key factor. Next project, next slide. And then we, and we, we've created uh, an Olnawag Indigenous Communities Foundation. Uh, next one. And that Indigenous Communities Foundation is created an LV project. We've got uh, approximately $15 million from MasterCard Foundation to get Indigenous youth engaged in their economies, specifically to help them figure out where they want to go. And we are, you know, we're not telling them where they want to go, but we are hoping that we, the activities that we are doing with our partners uh, will lead to an interest in the science-based uh, industries, including agriculture, and fisheries and forestries, engineering, uh, environment. Oh, and so th this, they, they are already on the ground. They're meeting with, with the people and they're trying to create that. So anyone in Atlantic Canada, uh, you know, if, if there's an interest there, please reach out and we will put you in contact. Next one. And that's just more, you know, some of the things they can, they, they basically, they are open to anything. If it makes sense, uh, that will lead to uh, something positive with the youth in the, in the Indigenous community is they can basically fund it. Again, they've been given the money from MasterCard Foundation, and we've been given the mandate to deliver it. What we've done is gone out and engaged Indigenous youth to deliver the program, and, and we're trying to stay away from it, but let them figure out where, where they should go with it. Next slide. And our digital Mi'kmaq has now been transformed into our Unlawek Education Center. And they are on the ground and, and, and their pathways too is to create interest in the sciences. And so we're working uh, with others. They've uh, now converted over and, and, and it's referred to as the Unlawek Education Center. Uh, they were originally set up to do coding. They got involved in robotics. They're now getting involved in, in activities on the ground, including greenhouses to get interest in agriculture. And, and build upon that. And it's to introduce the youth to all those possibilities in that with the greenhouses, it can lead to solar power, it can lead to food security, it can lead to all those opportunities, but also pathways going forward. So next slide. And so the, these are just, I mean, what we've done here, and we have good relationships here with uh, uh, these organizations, ACADA, which is Atlantic Canada Aerospace and Defense Association, uh, APEC, which is Atlantic Province Economic Council, uh, Atlantic University Associate Academics, the Engineers, Architects, Public Service and Procurement Canada Advisory Group, the Bank of Canada is consulting with us. We are part of Indigenous Works. We have just got a draft agreement with my tax that we, this is going to be unique it would be the first time that my tax is embedded a my tax employee within an indigenous organization to increase the, in, the indigenous participation in the sciences and the research sector uh, and we we are hoping that we can use this space again to back back up and and, and complement what we're doing with the youth foundation and our education center and we, of course, we participate with Canadian Council of Aboriginal Business and Jolene, the another uh, panelist. And I just sat on a, a, a committee of CCAB. Uh, we're involved with that. Sure, Ignite Labs, we have a relationship with Ignite Labs. Uh, and Ignite is an innovation space and we, we have a, a formal collaboration cooperation agreement with them. We are, per we are specifically working in a couple of communities right now as tests to build uh, pathways into the sciences and anything's open, but we're right now we're going into Pictou Landing First Nation with the Discovery Center here and uh, with our education center to build possible opportunities. And but we are we become the conduit to connect the indigenous business sector with the non-indigenous sector. And of course we we are, we closely work with Jedi uh, in New Brunswick and Mebo, the Mi'kmaq Economic Benefit Offices and Atlantic Province Council and MCPEI. Next slide. 
And so that, that's a summary of what we do, but then some of the specific activities, as we said, in terms of food services and food security, uh, we, we played a role in getting Annapolis Valley First Nation to acquire the Webster's Farm. The Webster's Farms was a fourth generation uh, farming operation here in, in the Annapolis Valley, Kings County, which is sort of the, the heart of agriculture in Atlantic Canada. And uh, the, the Annapolis Valley First Nation are now bought, have bought and are in the process of uh, acquiring full ownership of uh, the, the farm. Uh, we, as we mentioned, we're doing uh, greenhouse operations. Uh, and another project that we've got into is the acquisition of Windhorse Farms, which was uh, for five or six generations in the Wenzel family in Lunenburg and it's old growth forest. We are going to acquire it and use it as an opportunity to introduce Indigenous youth to uh, foraging and products of the forest. And so, I mean, I guess there's, we are involved in just a lot of different activities and uh, we, we encourage people to, you know, that there are lots of opportunities and, and the best way to do it is if you see an opportunity, go seek it out, knock on a door and um, see who, who's there to help you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Paul. You guys are doing absolutely amazing stuff. And I love that it's it's not it's not limited. I think it's it's that idea that think bigger than anyone can achieve in a lifetime and, and you're doing it. These the partnerships I'm hearing have been quite quite key in opening some additional doors for First Nations in that area and for and for the people your organization represents. So I love that you guys it, and purchasing other acquisitions. Yes, yeah. Yeah, really, really great. Um, I'm going to now invite our other two speakers of you um, to uh, share some perspectives. And now we're going to get into the conversation part, everyone. Um, the idea is that if you guys have any, to our audience, any questions you would like to ask to Paul, to Jolene or to Mike, um, just add them into the Q&A feature. It should be on the bottom of your screen when you move your cursor down. It will bring up um, how many uh, Q, you can do bring an, up Q&A. You can ask a question directly to any one of our speakers or you can just add it in the chat itself. I'll be monitoring both of those and, and may just ask the, the uh, our speakers to answer the questions throughout. So feel free to ask any of them questions. Um, the other thing, feel free to introduce yourself to the rest of the people if you haven't yet yet done it. Um, our target here is to do our conversation with the Q&A till um, the top of the hour. And then we're going to go into our resource people with Agriculture Agri-Foods Canada. And we'll be doing the draw and our target is to finish here at quarter after the next hour. So to give you some feedback here. So I'm gonna to go to our uh, first our first speaker and that's Mike Randall with Lennox Island First Nation. Um, for those of you guys that don't know, um, Lennox Island actually has over 30, 30 boats in its commercial and traditional lobster fishery. Um, uh, Mike, you guys have also been harvesting oysters, snow crab, clams, and, and many other fish resources at Lennox Island. And then there's also the Lennox Island Micmac Cultural and Tourism Center where Micmac foods are available. Um, can you sort of give an overview of your fisheries and agriculture and food areas and activities in your area and your community? Yeah, sure. sure. Um, okay, my name is uh, Mike Randall. I'm the um, I'm Director of Economic Development and the Executive Director for the Development Corporation. Um, so I guess under our umbrella, um, a, a lot of the food sustainability, food security, and everything else like that kind of falls under under us. Um, so our team has been, you know, diligent in working with the community, working with the elders, working with external parties, trying to find, uh, you know, the best ways to be able to sustain these these serious and very crucial items for our community. Um, so I guess, uh, you know, moving past the Marshall decision, um, we now hold about 393 licenses in fisheries in general. So that, that would be everything from uh, lobster, snow crab, rock crab, um, herring, um, silver sides, oysters, mussels, and so on and so forth. Some of them, like a majority of them or a lot of them aren't being used, um, nor do we just want to, you know, rent the license out to non-Indigenous people. So what we try to do is build the capacity, um, try to seek out ways that, you know, if somebody's wanting to take over a license for a season or two to get their feet wet, no pun intended, that they're able to <laughs> really move forward with, uh, 
with being able to sustain themselves and their families and so on and so forth. Um, a lot of the initiatives when our chief Darlene came back in, um, she was chief for 15 years and then um, took a break for a few for a couple of terms and then uh, re-opted about two, two and a half years ago or so. So one of the uh, one of the stronger initiatives that we moved forward with was called the shop, which is Malsanogam, which is basically for the people. Um, so basically what we're looking at here is kind of a secondhand store. At the same time, we also do uh, the food security part. So we have everything from, you know, um, trying to uh, make sure that everybody, nobody's going hungry, basically, at the end of the day, you know, <laughs> long story short. So what we're trying to do there is be able to, you know, and I guess to rewind a bit, um, when Dorian hit us in in uh, the eastern provinces pretty hard, uh, we, you know, we went without power, we had, you know, basements flooding, we had elders, we had people living off reserve that were kind of screwed at the time, right? I mean, already, already living off a terrible social system, the way it was set up, let alone coming in and then having uh, Dorian and then when COVID hit, and it was just you know, um, all the issues that come out of these kind of things were starting to come in. So what we had to do is act fast and and be able to leave nobody out. So we started dealing with our community uh, right away, trying to make sure that uh, that they had food on the table. Um, some of these individuals have five, six plus kids, right? So we need to make sure that all their needs are being met. Um, they're not freezing and they're not starving. And and you know and and it's not just bare minimum. I mean, we try to go above and beyond for everybody. We try to make sure that, you know, under the Christmas tree is filled with toys and, and whatever else, right? So we try to do our best for on and off reserve. And that that's really crucial for, for people to understand that it is really on and off reserve. Our title, our title uh, what is it? 1,200 individuals, they don't all live on PEI, but what we can do is try to maintain that. So uh, through, that, through that location, we're able to do that. Then um, to Paul's um, presentation a bit, we uh, we worked with Digital Mi'kmaq on bringing in um, a greenhouse and gardening and everything else. So what we're able to do there is is this year was kind of a trial year. Well, to my surprise, it ended up being an amazing year. We actually ended up hiring two great individuals that really took it seriously and were able to make or be able to grow more food than we needed. We then we could give out which drives us into another problem is reintroducing these healthy foods and everything else into the community that has been gone without those foods for so long, traditional foods and healthy alternative foods, um, which is very hard when people are on social um, and they have a family to feed. You can't go to Walmart or a superstore and buy a bag of apples and expect your family to be fed for the week because the price of apples <laughs> compared to craft dinner, I mean, it's unfortunately that's the way it is. So what we've been trying to do is reintroduce a lot of these foods, even if we have to make it like pre-made salads that we make from our pro produce that we have in our greenhouse to be able to supply the community, whether we sell them at a, a great discount price, um, but at least have those items available. Um, and then through our health center, we've been able to try to do some healthy living workshops, some preserving workshops and everything else. So people know what the heck to do with it besides salad and bok choy and all these random things that I don't know how those ended up on the list, but anyway, um, but that was also crucial too, was to do the survey for, um, to know what the community would like, uh, wasn't just only way it wasn't digital Mi'kmaq and it wasn't myself or external you know systems that were telling us what we need to buy it was based on community survey that was filled out actually we had a pretty good turnout on that survey um what we actually needed to grow and so when we look at the bigger picture of um is this an economic you know uh drive that's going to help this greenhouse continue um, in PEI, I don't know. Uh, that's also been the worry about keeping it sustainable. Um, so what we may look at is probably about 60-40% that if we can look for 60% funding to keep this sustainable, maybe, you know, between 40 and 30 or 20% uh, on our sales, then maybe we can keep it going a little bit better. But there are so many farmers markets, there are so many mom and pop shops, there are so many, um, you know, hobby farms in PEI as it is that these people need second jobs just to keep themselves going. And these could be generational farms as well. So we have to keep that in mind. Um, I know that it does weigh heavy on our staff at the greenhouse. Um, 
but again, I mean, that stuff falls on, on the development corporation shoulders and chief and council and everything else to keep these initiatives going because of, because of the important crucial role that it plays within our community. Uh, um, thank, thank you, Mike. I just I wanted to say that um, you you had reached out to your community to find out what their interest is is first. And so the first thing that's been driving your your greenhousing is is community health yeah. and improving improving that. Um, now, at at some stage, do you foresee that maybe part of sustainability might be um, selling locally and, and repackaging it? Yeah. So that's the other part is when yeah. we brought we brought a few chefs in and we asked the question, you know, like uh, about what, you know, when we go out there, how do we package it? How do we sell it? What's our story? Yeah. And, stuff like this? and they said, um, basically, you don't ask them what they would like to see. We tell them what are our traditional foods. And it's like, well, you know, like shit, obviously. Yeah. And yeah. for some reason, we were so trying to please the market and please these people instead of just saying, well, here's our traditional foods. Here's our foods that have been grown, that have been taken away, eliminated, so on and so forth. Um, and, you know, a lot of it comes back to truth and reconciliation, being able to supply heirloom foods or or um, or corn and stuff like this that we're able to kind of bring to these restaurants. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the restaurants now are, are younger generations that are seeing the changes of the time and they're seeing and understanding what's going on in society. So they want to be a part of the uh, of the of the solution and, and not part of the problem. So this is great to hear from some of the larger buyers and PEI. So. I think we do have some positivity moving forward for, you know, for revenue coming our way from this. Fantastic. So reminding that um, restoring Indigenous foods and like you said, the heritage, the heritage foods itself. Um, and you also have your, your, um, your tourism center or any of these products going in there. Yeah. So with our, uh, so we have, you know, 50 some acres, 50.4 yeah. yeah. acres of uh, blueberry fields. So what we do is try to be able to get those and freeze them if we can't get them, you know, have them sold by our, by who, who, we, who does our harvesting. Um, and then as well as we are, you know, during our Saint and Sunday celebration, we always have, um, we either do Bannock or something else. Then we put, um, we put blueberry sauce and blueberries in oh my. that. So we want to be able to preserve that, be able to sell it from there as well. But with our tourism piece, we do a great uh, experience. And it seems to be our number one experience, even throughout COVID is uh, uh, bannock and clams in the sand. So basically we're cooking uh, bannock and clams or oysters or whatever it is in the sand. Uh, and it was just a traditional idea that's always been going. It was, you know, obviously knocked off everyone's thoughts for a long time until the we brought the elders in and they started talking about it like it was nothing. And we're, we're like, what the hell are you talking about? Anyway, so then it turned into being one of our number one experiences. And those oysters will be supplied from um, our grow out, which we own 20 acre grow out for oysters. Um, and those oysters that are out there, which will be into the to be sold next year um, are actually created from spawn at our hatchery. So it's kind of like beginning to, to end for us, I guess, for, for the oysters. So that's another part that we're, we're trying to capitalize and work on our, our marketing and, um, and our packaging, definitely on that idea, what we're going to move forward for next, um, next spring. Wow. That's it's like, it's really a closed system, food security, and also creating your own food sovereignty. I want to ask you um, two more questions here. They come from Bradley, and then I'm going to go over to Jolene, jo to Jolene, because it just feeds right into, and there's my first pun of this session, feed. Um, it, it really just feeds into what Jolene's been doing, doing. but um, Bradley has asked, uh, can you share your community survey and are all of the foods you produce, um, um, is it always a sale when you provide food to the community? So uh, I'll check on the surveys part. I'm sure we can give out the, the you know, the marketing is evident. Yeah. yeah. Um, and the other part is um, what we want to do, and this is something that came, it was kind of obviously a no brainer part is that we want to be able to supply the elders with these, with this healthy food alternatives from our greenhouse and gardens. We also want to be able to um, provide uh, prescription boxes, subscription, prescription. I always mix that up. Boxes. Subscription. Yeah. yeah. For our, uh, for anyone that's on social. So we worked with the health center to be able to pay for those. So when individuals are on social, whatever, they're able to kind of get them. Transactions are done very discreetly. So it's not like, oh, another free one over here. 
it's done very because we don't want to have any kind of thoughts or discriminatory any kind of anything involved with trying to get people healthy food um so that's the way that part's been doing um and then for our community members there's definitely a, um, a bit of a discount obviously no tax but no that we definitely try to do a tax or um uh, kind of a better setup for community members and then when we move it out to outside of the community um is the price is a little bit higher just to stay on par with the other um with the other shops that are selling kind of on par food like we are so finding your place within the competitive environment but first of all making sure that your community's health needs are met and there's accessible affordable yeah. affordable food so um thank you mike I want to, it was, um, I want to go over to Jolene now, because as I mentioned, you know, I, I, I love her product. It's when I was searching for Indigenous agricultural um, food products uh, uh, last year, this one came up and it really, it stood out uh, also because of its packaging it, itself. So in this session, you know, how do you go, Jolene, you know, you're, you're, uh, it's another thing that stood out is that it stood out because it's packaging because it's also award winning. So, and, and it's, I, I, I can't, I can't wow you guys enough to tell you how much I'm wowed by, by this product. So, you know, you were saying, Mike, you know, with your bannock and clams in the sand, that came from an, in, your, your Indigenous community, working closely with your elders and your community members and restoring some foods that were, made your area unique. And to Jolene, you know, you're an award-winning business. You've got a lot of success in that. Your packaging is, is absolutely phenomenal. Um, tell us, how did you launch your business? How did you come up with that I, I idea and, and and tell us about creating your brand and your look because it's it's really stunning and just a jar it's everything so, <laughs> well thank you and uh so yeah hi everyone and uh my name is Jolene founder and CEO of Wabanaki Maple um how did I launch the business well I mean it goes back quite a while ago and, and I had a, a seed planted so to speak I I've been working uh, seasonally and Christmas tree farming and, and harvesting maple syrup on a harp on my sister's hobby farm for over 20 years now. And, you know, I guess it, it um, I came to a point in my career of working in restaurant and culinary as well, that I just, I, I found that it wasn't satisfying and I, I wanted to move forward in another direction and start my own business. That being into the maple syrup, because I knew there was opportunities there. Um, and, and the other side of that was that, you know, we take this, this uh, resource, I think mostly for granted that it's there and, you know, but, but where did it come from? Where did it originate? And I, and that was a big piece for me to share the indigenous side of it, that, you know, um, it, it's always been part of our culture. And so launching the business, it took me well over a year before I could get all my ideas and the plan onto paper and, and um, you know, source funding to get it started. But it, it initially, you know, started in 2018 when I launched, but ever since I've, I've just been, you know, growing, I want to say, step by step gradually, but now we're really starting to ramp things up. And, um, and I just wanted to clarify one thing. I know you, when you introduced us, it was that we are tapping our own trees. And to clarify, we're not tapping just yet. We ideally would have loved to initially, but that's another, uh, you know, another opportunity that's a little bit challenging is to, to source, um, to secure the land to do so. So um, initially starting out, this was, a, I want to say, a way to access into the industry was to source from local suppliers and get a little creative and using my culinary <laughs> mindset, uh, mixed it up and, and put a little twist on the maple syrup industry. So you know, that's, that's kind of how I started out. And, and I had accessed um, a network uh, uh, with different organizations like Jedi, uh, Paul mentioned Jedi, fantastic um, uh, or non-for-profit organization to help foster indigenous and an entrepreneur economic growth. And so, you know, that's where I kind of pulled together help. They helped me pull together my marketing plan, my business plan, the branding ideas that I had, you know, get them digitalized so that I could actually, you know, um, produce the branding, the bottles, the branding, the all the marketing materials that that I had envisioned in my mind. Yeah.
so you access some some external services for those of you that don't know what jedi is i'm going to send put the link in here but it's the joint economic development initiative and for um, people in other parts of Canada, that one is a regional one. So in other parts of Canada, uh, in Western Canada, be Western diversification. Um, and there's just some other other organizations across across it. So um, so Jedi helped you with your your brand packaging. And 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 uh, one of the things you mentioned was uh, was local sourcing. So how'd you come up with the idea of the of the of uh, the look and the shape of it? And, and that 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 began even before I, you know, yeah. because I participated with Jedi's in their incubator, the business incubator program. Um, but the idea behind the branding and how it, I wanted it to look, you know, that that started before I even launched the business. I knew that I wanted it to represent a richness and vibrant piece of our culture. And it, it just needed to, I wanted it to, to, to speak that when you picked up our product, it was, you yes. know, you first see, you know, it's, it's indigenous product and it's, it's very rich. It's, it's a premium, you know, as our culture. <laughs> so, um, you know, I worked with uh, mentorship uh, mentors and coaching through Jedi and then, you know, found a, a, a marketing agency to help digitalize the draft designs and things um, to actually be able to print out our labels and and in a sustainable way too. That was the other thing is number one always in in my mind was to be to practice in a sustainable manner to ha manner to have eco friendly packaging and products. It, it goes right across the board to be able to give back to our mother earth in you know as these gifts are being offered. We need to give back and that that was one way I thought. That's how I'm going to do it and, and carry on throughout the, the business with, with our packaging and, you know, as, as environmentally friendly as we can be, that, that was very important and still is important for us. So, you know, paper, glass, um, anything that's uh, more sustainable. And then obviously um, moving, you know, growing the company was, it, it, it did start with the why and just wanting to give back to our community and our environment and, and being able to create some sustainable and meaningful jobs for our community members. Obviously, unemployment, um, we feel that right across the board throughout our, our community. So if I could hire one or two people at least, you know, to, to get them some, some um, meaningful work, then that, that was a big, that's an important factor uh, moving forward. We're just nicely starting to expand we've got a new expansion in the progress right now so we'll be able to accommodate and be able to hire uh, another four to five more um folks for to to help yeah thanks jolene I, I wanted to for for all of you you talked about sourcing locally and and to get started and um even uh, you know i know that with a soyas indian band with their Inkmeat winery that's how they started off too while they were letting their wine cure in the bot in the barrels and your mm -hmm. syrup cures in what brandy and whiskey barrels um actually not brandy yeah. <laughs> but we do have we have a regular toasted oak a lightly toasted mm -hmm. oak barrel which mm -hmm. there is no alcohol but we also source um uh, previously poured spirit barrels such as bourbon and whiskey and we just recently launched a rum as well but and ideally moving forward I mean there are other ideas uh, to create recipes that we're looking at creating but it, it's uh, there's a lot more work involved in the R&D than I ever imagined uh, starting out like I just I, I, I never I never imagined like you, you look at different uh, the CFIA and and, and all these labeling requirements it's been a major major um there, there's been some hurdles and roadblocks throughout the you know the past three years and we're still you know we still have to work at you know improving and and, and fixing things along the way so um yeah. Jolene, you, you mentioned cfia ia could you um let other people know what that is and and how oh, did you work work with them and then we're going to go to mike and paul if they can add to yeah. sourcing branding r d Sure. Sorry about the uh, the acronym. So that yeah. would be <laughs> Canadian Food Inspection Agency, and and so you know, of course they have their uh, restrictions and regulations and cert certifications that you have to abide by. And and in fact, starting out when I first started, part of uh, the labeling, 
it had been approved at one point, but only to have been, well, we'll say, dis they, 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 I had to go back to the table and uh, redesign just because of font sizes of certain, like the bourbon. And, and so it was like, it, it can be really costly and cause a lot of headaches if you're not reaching out to the proper networks and, and consulting companies to get those things down pat. Like that, that's one thing I would recommend. If you're gonna you know, start a company in food or beverage, you, you should have the you know, expertise, subject matter expertise at your, you know, on your, on your list of your contacts, because I've, I've had my share of things. Um, but moving forward, we, we, we've been able to uh, make the uh, corrections and, and continue. But yeah, so there, there there's lots of different um, uh, certifications and things that go along with food and beverage, like I say, not just with CFIA, but um, I'm sure we're, we're looking at now planning on exporting. So there's other certifications that we're gonna to have to, um, to acquire moving forward. Yeah. So for those of you in our audience listening, um, you're saying, you know, start early working with the labeling agencies and, and for local markets, I understand that uh, labeling requirements are less stringent, but as you're starting to expand each market out, then the, the requirements um, are more technical and, and, and detailed. Like you're saying in the export market, there's, there's additional uh, rules and guidelines you have to comply with. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Great. Let's, um, let's hear from Mike and, and Paul on this one. Um, how are you guys doing product packaging and marketing and accessing new markets? And Jolene even mentioned research and development, always thinking about that and, and being on top of new opportunities. So Mike, I see um, um, you uh, nodding. So I'm going to go to Mike first and then to Paul. Yeah, I guess, you know, understanding what, what the demand is in the market, especially when it's like a specialty item or something else that that you want to be able to get it out there and for us um we get really excited about the branding part we get really excited about being able to create the design and kind of what um what we can intertwine with that you know anyone else there out there is able to understand it and appreciate it but also internally we're able to know that we've added our own kind of Mi'kmaq theme to it or or just like in a cultural aspect to it so you know anything that we've started from you know Malta cannabis to um to the shop Malsanogam or to our new experience Lennox Island uh, branding that we just launched um two and a half weeks ago three weeks ago um we needed to jump out, we needed to stand out. And we, we obviously are very conscious of that. So, you know, when now that we're moving into the exercise of really branding our own Lenox Island uh, choice oysters uh, for next year, we really want to be able to hit the mark there. And there's a lot of great ideas. And I mean, PEI is just smothered in the oyster industry. And there's a lot of different players out there that have gone the length, but, you know, you do need those expertise you do need to be able to look at options be able to you know get the for us it would be you know approval from you know depending if we want to get a little risky or if we want to you know what angle that we want to go but you know chief and council we need their blessing as well um you know and it's nice to be able to have elders just say like you know maybe maybe not maybe rethink that or you know i've you know years and years and years ago i mean i've you know, thought of these ideas and stuff like that. And, and I presented them and we had a few elders in there and there was just like probably six of us and, and they waited for me to be finished and everything else. And then they let me have it. And then I'm just like, shit, sorry, <laughs> I'm the idiot. I like, I just felt like running away, but he's like, no, 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 you need to sit and understand where you kind of fell off tracks or why you don't do this in a certain way and everything else like that. So it was a great learning experience humbling which is which is always good too um but really at the end of the day the the branding has to kind of explain you in a picture or explain what you do or your product it, within like whatever it takes three seconds five seconds to look at a picture and kind of have a good idea of like that looks like something i want to do or that's something i want to buy or be a part of thank you mike i like that it's like present your ideas, but also run them by people. I, I think of a logo I, I saw a few years ago for a building corporation. And I, I told them, I said, I, it was 
one I didn't know. I said, do you realize this, this looks like something not like, like isn't a building. And they went on to explain what they thought, what, what it was. And I went, uh, I know it's supposed to intend to be that, but it's, <laughs> um, you needed to run this by a test market. So yeah. test marketing, you're saying your, your elders, your community is going to guide you on how to do it and, and, and finding your niche in that competitive market. Mm -hmm. it's key like it's very key because a clam coming from the same source as other as 10 others you need to create a, a message a meaning around it to give it like to give it yeah. additional feeling and and connect the buyer with that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. very good um paul your thoughts on how do we brand and market and enter and enter new markets itself because jolene i understand you and jolene have sat on the canadian council for aboriginal business and we'll add that link link um to our chat here um but you guys are sitting on a committee for export so how do our 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 indigenous uh producers um build and and enter new markets including export markets Uh, you're on mute. Paula, if you can take yourself off mute. There we go. Yeah. Do Thank we have you, a full, full, full hour to talk this topic <laughs> of branding? Uh, Sounds and, and like I, we're going to need another session for that. But uh, I, I will back up here, though, and, and say what Jolene is doing is, is very typical of an entrepreneur going into a commodity market and trying to brand it. And, and when I refer to commodity marketing, I mean, basically, uh, a lot of agricultural products are, are just a pure commodity. There's no brand to it. So you buy grain, you buy wheat, you buy potatoes, you buy corn. There's, there's no marketing to it. And maple syrup can be bought on a bulk basis, just like uh, any other um, agricultural product. But what Jolene is doing is a unique thing of creating a brand that has value and then marketing that. And, and she's and, and if you listen to what she's saying, it's a real, it's not an easy step, but there's steps that, it's not an easy process, but there's steps that you have to take. And the best way of doing it is to get yourself immersed in it and reach out to all that is out there. I mean, I mean, across, you know, I've worked in almost every jurisdiction in Canada, including Baffin Island and Northwest Territories and, and Saskatchewan. But there's always entrepreneurs and others out there who will help you, who can become a mentor or a go-to person, but also government agencies who have the specific mandate of doing that. The provincial departments of agriculture, the federal departments of agriculture, Ag Canada, Ag Food, but Farm Credit Corporation, um, you know, they, they, they do have their own indigenous uh, mandate to, to increase this. And so don't try to do it on your own, find out who it is, but it is, it is about branding and, and uh, you know, it is about getting that message out there and you gotta be careful. Like um, Mike re referenced going to the elders, and, and you, if you are going to move into that cultural community of, of trying to market as an Indigenous product, you want to make sure that you've got the support of the elders from your home community to, to go for it. Again, it's a matter of just, you know, like, like find out as much as you can start, you know, start off with a notebook, start making notes and, and jump in there and merge yourself into the broad ecosystem of what's involved in your industry. You, there's lots of information out there, but don't just search search the web, make the contact, go talk to people, go knock on doors, go find out who else is doing it uh, with your product or similar products. It, it, there, there's processes there. A lot of people have already you know, made the mistakes and they'll, they're re ready to share with you. So, I mean, it is, but you, when you, you got to get your brand and you got to figure out your brand and then you got to stick with that brand and make sure that the, your, that strategy is, what, is based on your brand. Excellent advice. Excellent advice, Paul. I like that, you know, uh, find out, connect with others. And one of the reasons we're doing these sessions is to is to help strengthen your connections with other Indigenous people, First Nations involved in agriculture and agri-foods. And, and Jolene is a great example of, of, um, of how you how you build it. You know, you're going to have some challenges along the way. It's just it's just inevitable. But learn from uh, from others wise ways. Um, also look internationally. We've got lots of international indigenous um, products out there and experiences to look at. So um, I'm gonna, uh, we've got a question here. Let's see, for Jolene, she uh, says, I I might've missed your, um, missed this during your presentation, however, because she's sourcing from multiple areas. Is this based under a cooperative model currently? So 
So I source locally within New Brunswick right now. Um, not to say I wouldn't source outside, you know, the Atlantic provinces, but I have some major players and in, in producers here. They are a, we're actually members of the New Brunswick Maple Syrup Association are the ones that uh, I connect with. I am actually a member myself of the New Brunswick Maple Syrup Association. So, yeah. Great, thanks, Jo. Thanks, Jolene. So, so um, Paul, re Paul, and Mike, and and you have all been identifying that your relationship with others, the industry sectors, the the expert advisory government agencies are key to keeping your businesses and your initiatives strong. Absolutely. For 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 me, I mean, first starting out navigating through the business ecosystem yeah. was just crazy. I was learning as I go every day was something new that I had to figure out. But, you know, the more network, you know, the more connections and, and networking that you participate in, um, the more you're going to have in your suitcase to work with, you know. So I partner with uh, co the Atlantic um Atlantic Canada Opportunities here agency in in New Brunswick and and uh, DAF um, Department of Agriculture. So and also just recently Illinois. Yeah. <laughs> so there's there's so many different great resources out there, but you do have to look. Sometimes they're not going to always be at your you know they're not necessarily coming to you, but you do have to do your research. You have to do your homework and figure out what is it you need, and then you know start making connections and and talking to people. So um absolutely uh having a strong network of uh various organizations agencies is, is um important like i say new brunswick maple syrup the association they were one of the first uh ones i connected with and actually had the opportunity to be invited to paris to attend the uh, the seal food trade show which i hadn't even launched my product yet but i get to go and experience that so those are those are things that i know now what to expect when once we do go and, and and participate maybe under the uh the pavilion the canadian pavilion one of these uh days in the future excellent thank thanks jolene it's like build your connections even before you launch your product and and um, it'll help to accelerate it um last question uh from the floor here and then we'll just go to a quick final comment from each of you before we go on to identifying some of those resources you're talking of you're talking about so um bradley barton was saying when you are branding your project your product who's your target market and does indigenous branding help separate you from the pack Anyone like to take that question on? I will defer to Jolene, but I do have a few comments on that. Uh, okay. okay. One more time. Can you repeat that question one more time? It's, Just because um, it seemed like it was a loaded one. <laughs> yeah. Does basically does branding, does indigenous branding help you separate your your product from uh, other competitors? Oh, absolutely. I, I think, you know, coming out of the gate, that was, um, that was a big um, differentiating uh, competitor, what, what's the word I'm thinking, I'm trying to say here, uh, competitive advantage, um, simply because too, being a, a female entrepreneur, an Indigenous female entrepreneur, and, and um, the first in New Brunswick actually to be um, to, to be marketing this type of product like it's 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 not it's maple syrup but it's added value there's a twist to it there's more and that was one thing you know um doing the research and homework that's where that industry our industry is particularly heading is the added value and transformation of products um so for sure it, it um i think we came into the came into the business at the right time too with the with the reconciliation as well um people are you know they're love they're they're supporting 100 percent um our the company and and what we're doing so and as far as our who we're marketing to uh more of a niche market it, it's it's a it's a premium product so we want to see it on the shelves of more higher-end boutiques and and specialty shops health food stores and and we're doing you know we're not doing any big big box superstore markets um, with our product. We're staying small, we're sm staying more personal, I wanna, I wanna say, if that makes sense. Yeah, great, thanks. I, I get emails from your business as well on, on how to use maple recipes. 
And so yeah. that's the other thing that's that's about connecting with your buyer is the recipes side, keeping a regular communication with them and, and giving them other ideas on how to use your use your product. Okay, I'm going to go to Paul and then final comment from Mike. Any advice you have on packaging, uh, marketing, production of your experience of your product? Paul. Just a yeah, general comment. There is value in Indigenous marketing, Indigenous branding. Uh, one has to do it very carefully and with cultural sensitivity at, at there. But we just recently in October in Wolfold, Nova Scotia here, the, again, the heartland of agricultural production uh, for Atlantic Canada, they host an international food and film festival and they bring in some big players thompson highway was the guest speaker this year anthony bourdain previously was here uh quest love from jimmy kim or oh, jimmy fallon show has been here uh, and this year's theme was indigenous and it was and and so the whole theme of this international food and film festival on food and film was indigenous there was real value in that you just have to be extremely cautious of how you present yourself and, and, and consult with your community on it. But yes, there is value. It's recognized that indigenous tourism, cultural tourism has real value. There's re real value in indigenous food. Food is a, can become a tourism based type of product. So, you know, it, whatever you can do to promote it, it will have, it will, it will add value again, doing it with caution. Uh, thank, thank you, Paul. Um, it does add value. And as Mike was saying, be cautious in how you do and make sure you run, run it by. So um, final final comment here from Mike, any advice? And, and for the three of you panelists, if you know a good wholesale packaging supply company, um, if you can just answer that question directly in the Q&A. So Mike, your final advice to our, our audience. Yeah, I guess... Um... I just, I guess, really, with the branding piece um, and being able to, you know, find your market and and whether it's doing test studies or just having that that focus groups or or surveys or whatever you need to do to be able to really maximize your, you know, your exposure on where you need to be, whether it's specialty or or whether it's general or or whether, like Paul mentioned about certain industries in, in agriculture that you know you're just selling, you know, like for us with the seed, we still branded as an indigenous owned and operated business. Uh, because that's very important to us um and do our buyers care at the end of the day who owns the business they like our product and they want to move forward with it and and they praise it or whatever else they do but it helps them within the industry and in, in the oyster industry and pei so you know but for us and and for you know we hope that at the end of the day it may open doors for more exporting outside of pei but for us, it is crucial for that branding to be on par for us. Um, it's a great exercise that we always felt that gets people energized and excited about the business. Thanks. I think, um, I think, thank you, um, Mike. I mean, you guys, all three of you guys were talking and it's like, do your homework, do your research. Um, and, and, you know, your research also includes a rolling out plan. Like how are you going to start and introduce your introduce your product and then what markets and geographically and, and expansion on that? I love Jolene that you mentioned reconciliation that that with that recognition of a need to um, create a, a fruitful relationship between First Nations and, and the non-indigenous community that um, it's it, it creates opportunities for our businesses. Um, when you and you guys have all said, there's opportunities to identify as an indigenous businesses now. And that it also, I think Mike, you were saying too, that, you know, to paraphrase the, uh, that it can create community pride to see their name on, on indigenous products and in businesses that are doing well. So remember um, to label your experience, your products as much as possible indigenous. There are markets available for that. And I heard a keyword from Jolene saying premium and, and being selective. You can do the wide Walmart um, target everybody approach, or you can go with the ones that will appreciate your, your experience. So thank you to, to all of our three panelists, to Jolene, to Paul, and to and to Mike on sharing your experiences and, and ideas and recommendations on Indigenous food product packaging um, involving community and also um, looking at research and development. Now, um, and please for you three, if you can just revisit the, the uh, questions from our our audience through the Q&A, if you can respond to those directly. I'm now going to move us on to our final activities here before we get to our 
before we get to the um, um, uh, final draw, draw here. And this is um, Farm Credit Canada. Jesse Robson isn't available today, but we've got Dominique Kelly from Agriculture Agri-Foods Canada um, as a tag team on just uh, highlighting some of the programs that Agriculture Agri-Food Canada does. Um, uh, Dominique. And for Paul, Mike, and and Jolene, um, Jolene's a regenerative, if you can just um, uh, off video, and then we can just focus on Dominique. So Dominique, you're up next. Hi, thank you. Um, my name is Dominic Kelly, and I'm the manager for the Indigenous Pathfinder Service at Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. Um, what we do and what our service is for is we work with Indigenous groups and Indigenous communities who are looking either to enter into agriculture or want to expand their agriculture business or agri-food uh, businesses. Um, clients can contact us directly and we'll work with them, we'll listen to their project ideas, and we'll help them to identify uh, programs and services that are available within our department. And then we also help each of the clients to connect to those programs and services. So we'll get people in touch of a, with a program manager, you know, program officers, and we help people walk through, uh, you know, step by step through the entire process. Um, Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada has uh, several programs I think that are going to be of interest to people here on this call today. Um, the first one is the Indigenous Agriculture Food Systems Initiative. Um, what this program is, it's a, it's a five-year, $8.5 million program that provides funding for Indigenous communities looking to develop an agriculture, agri-food project that is community-focused and Indigenous-led. Um, the only um, kind of caveat on this program is the program has to support economic development and be self-sustaining within a reasonable amount of time after the funding has been issued. So we're looking at like projects being like sustainable within pretty much two to three years. Um, we're not looking for projects to have like large profits, but be able to, you know, generate enough income and revenue to keep that, uh, that project um, ongoing and be able to fund its day to day. Go to the next slide, please. I'm not sure. Um, the other program that we do have, it, it's not up here. It, oh, there we go. We have the Agri-Diversity Program. Uh, this is more of a, a national focus type program um, that works with youth, women, and Indigenous people and people personalities, or sorry, disabilities, to be able to uh, develop a national representation. So in this program, we've worked with several groups that have gone from like not having a national representation to having like full national representation. Um, and we also fund other things like if you're looking or if you have like a regional type um, conference, um, anything like that, uh, this program has also will also provide some funding for that conference to happen. So it doesn't have to be national in every case, but in some cases it could just be like regional participation. Um, the fourth program that we have here is the Local Food Infrastructure Fund. Um, this fund is now, it's five years, uh, $50 million uh, program. We've had four intakes to ELSIF already, and a fifth intake is going to happen sometime in the near future. Uh, that's being developed right now. Uh, the purpose of the Local Food Infrastructure Fund is to provide funding to Indigenous communities um, who are looking to increase food security or food safety um, within their community. So this program doesn't have any economic component to it. It's more about uh, providing kind of safe uh, food systems for communities. Um, there are a couple other programs I'd like to talk about that we didn't put onto the slide here, and this is about marketing that may be of interest. Um, the first program would be like to talk about is agri-marketing. We have this agri-marketing program that will work with sectors um, in like indigenous uh, like provinces or like regional sectors to develop like marketing strategies um, for your products and to develop like advertisements, um, other, other type of kind of like, um, materials like that to be able to get you, your information out to the market. Um, and then another one that we do have too that may be of interest is the Canada brand. 
So Canada brand is identifying your product as being Canadian. So if that's of interest to you, like that is something like we can talk about. Um, I'll provide my contact information and I can get you like the information for it. Um, and then the, the final one I'd like to talk about is Agra Assurance, or just to mention, we're not you know, going into too much detail. And I think Agra Insurance is probably one that you may be like very interested in. Agra Insurance will fund, and we've been looking for um, an opportunity for a while now to be able to develop like an indigenous type branding type program. And so Agra Insurance, um, you know, if somebody's, you know, looking to develop like something that would provide like that, you know, that indigenous brand um, that would be say for the region, say for the Maritimes, for all of Canada, for, you know, just a certain region. Um, I know the program officers and managers there are, you know, looking for that opportunity to work with an indigenous group. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Dominique. Um, uh, and for adding those two, those three other programs here. So we're talking Agri Marketing, Canada Brand, and Agri Assurance. So CARC will draft a um, the mess the uh, contact list up on that and distribute to all of all of the participants and add those to it. So thank you. Those are right up the ideal. And that idea of the indigenous brand, uh, whether it's regional or even national. Thank you, because people have been talking about. It, they've mentioned it in some of the other discussions and. Um, Thank you for um, opening the door for, for bringing that forward more. Okay, guys, we are at the stage now where we are um, some other some other resources itself, um, and then we got to do the draw. So don't forget, and and some of our speakers even mentioned mentioned these other initiatives. I've met, I've broken these into two columns. So under regional initiatives, don't forget we're not just talking about agriculture, but there's also um, harvesting that connects into forestry. Look into tourism that was mentioned today, health, culture, and heritage. Anything to do in in those five industries tend to link well with with Indigenous agricultural initiatives. Don't forget about skills development with the ISATs and AMEC is one of the initiatives. Um, EJ Fontaine is going to be speaking in our last session on December 7th, and he is going to talk about some of their training and, and cultural development that he's been involved in. Um, the business funding, we've got the National Aboriginal Capital Corporations with Ulnu Week is, is one of them, but they're all across Canada. So we've got this link to, to send out. And um, uh, Dominic mentioned some of the federal programs and so some of our speakers with Canadian Food Inspection Agency. Don't forget there's also provincial and territorial uh, government ministries that also provide direct services. Uh, many of them are also linked in with the Indigenous organizations or work with work with them. A number, a number of those people are actually um, on this session itself um, and, and as Jolene mentioned, you know, she, she partnered immediately with um, the maple syrup agency in her area. FYI, Canada produces almost all of the maple syrup um, internationally. I think Quebec is 70%, Atlantic Canada is the rest of it. And then there are some producers in the States, but uh, almost all of the world's maple syrup comes out of, out of Canada. And don't forget, you've heard too, um, that in some of our sessions, we've had some of our audience from um, like Eggkin Classroom and 4-H. So look for these different programs itself. Um, um, uh, Farm Credit Can is one of them. You've heard of that. So they do a number of different things. So they're also um, an, access, an, an accessible resource to our Indigenous and First Nations agriculture producers. And then we are now at the stage where we go to the final draw. So I'm going to uh, uh, the draw. So remember that you must be in attendance to win. So if your name is drawn, indicate with a hand wave or a message in the chat. If you're not, if we don't hear from you fairly immediately when we name your name, we'll be moving on because um, you must be present to win. Our next session is though on greenhousing. That's next week. The National Indigenous Agricultural Association with Dale Worm is going to be speaking. Stephanie Cook with the office. Apasquayak Cree Nation. They've got the vertical aquaponics in the greenhouse. They've got an amazing story. They're launched for health initiatives, but have expanded into 
um, other um, non-commercial markets and Jacob Beaton from Tea Creek Farm. And uh, he's been doing the youth training program. They're the couple that sold their business in Vancouver, Victoria and bought a farm. And uh, if you talk to him, he said, I knew nothing about soil when I did this. And now he's an expert and they're also doing biofuels in there. So community gardens. So that's our, our, our next week. And our final session is on traditions, processing and storage. Some of the people from Makovic as well as Nunavik uh, Regional Board of Health are going are, have been in their, our sessions. Um, they're going to talk about their food product uh, food projects itself to create food security, some really interesting and uh, dynamic things they're, they're doing um, in for Inuit and Nunavut people. Uh, we've got Dawn Tabunbongnang, Bondung, we're First Nations grower. She's into harvesting and cultivating foods, uh, uh, seeds itself. And we've got Elmer E.J. Fontaine. He's probably been in agriculture, well, he's been in agriculture all of his life. And he's got a cattle ranch. They do labor training and he's got a newsletter that goes out and promotes native news across Canada. Thank you guys for joining us. I want to thank our, our, our panelists and our co-hosts. First of all, Paul Langdon for Ulna Wig for being our co-host for these sessions, Atlantic Canada. Um, also, Mike Randall from Lennox Island First Nation and Jolene Lasky with Wabanaki with Wabanaki maple syrup and also to Dominic Kelly from Agriculture Food Canada and again from Canadian Agriculture Human Resources Canada. Thank you all for being with us today. Um, we look forward to jo you joining us for our last two sessions and, and feel free to network and please do our survey. Have a great day. Uh, be kind, be safe and, um, and um, sending everybody love. Thanks for joining us.